This is Eric White. Whenever I embark on a new OpenXML development project, whether it be a simple little proof of concept or an example program or a major programming effort, the first thing I always do is I go grab some modules from Power Tools for OpenXML. Over the years, I've developed some favorite functionality and encapsulated that in certain methods and certain classes in some utility modules in Power Tools for OpenXML. I've come to rely on those utility methods and classes. They are pretty useful. Those utility methods and classes can be divided generally up into three categories. The first category are utility methods and classes that are really not OpenXML specific. One of my favorite ways to program with OpenXML is using language integrated query and using it in the pure functional style. There are some specific areas of functionality that I regularly need when doing pure functional transformations and when writing language integrated queries. And I've placed all of these non-OpenXML specific methods and classes in ptutil.cs. In this screencast, I'm going to introduce these. The first one I want to talk about is elements before self reverse document order. Fairly often when you are writing queries into an OpenXML document, you need to select elements in an XML tree based on the element just preceding it. As an example, in Document Builder, there are times when Document Builder has to take specific action based on whether the paragraph just preceding a current paragraph contains a section. In other words, contains a descendant of section properties. If you look at the link to XML method elements before self, you will see that this method returns the sibling elements before this node in document order. What this means is if you want to find the paragraph just immediately preceding, then you have to get all the paragraphs preceding that paragraph and get the last one in the returned collection. If you are operating on a long document, this could be a very slow process. It uses an inordinate amount of CPU time and memory. If you look at the xnode.previousNode property, you will see that this does return the previous node, and you could then loop through until you get the previous element. But the problem with this one is, as you can see, the X container stores its child nodes as a singly linked list of X node objects. This means that the previous node property must traverse the entire list of direct child nodes under the parent container. When I was testing Document Builder on large documents, this really proved to be a performance bottleneck. So the approach that I took is I wrote an extension method, elements before self reverse document order. What this extension method does is it first looks on the element and sees if there is an annotation of reverse document order info. And if there is no such annotation, then it initializes the reverse document order information by calling this method. And what this method does is it iterates through all the elements of the parent and adds an annotation that effectively tells what the previous sibling is for every single element that is a child of that particular parent. So this operation is a little bit expensive the first time you run it in that it iterates through all the children of the parent of the element that you're getting the previous sibling for. But after that, it operates very, very quickly. It just gets the annotation, and the annotation tells what the previous sibling is. When I added this small amount of functionality, then Document Builder sped up by an order of magnitude on large documents. One key point about this is this approach works best when you are using a pure functional approach. If you are modifying the list of elements for which you need to get the previous sibling element, 
then these annotations will become stale. This is best used when you take a pure functional approach where you never modify any data. If you're not sure what I mean by pure functional code, take a look at this post. It will explain the issue of purity. The next utility method that is pretty useful is to string new line on attributes. Here I have a little OpenXML program that it opens up a word processing document. It gets the X document for the main document part and then it writes to the console the root element. And if I run it, I see something like this. And what we can see is for every one of these elements where there are multiple attributes, the attributes are listed out all on the same line. It isn't too bad in this example, but when you're working with an element that might have 15 attributes, it becomes very hard to see all the values for those attributes. So if we change this code so that it reads console.writeline xdoc.root.toString newline on attributes, then the output looks like this. And you can see down here with the pgmar element that all of the attributes are listed each on their separate line. This is a more convenient way to dump out markup when you are using link to XML. The next method of interest is the string concatenate method. Fairly often when you are working with OpenXML markup, you will have a collection of strings. So for instance, you may have assembled a collection of all of the text elements that are of interest to you. Perhaps they are all of the text elements that are within all the runs for a particular paragraph. And you want to get the entire string of that paragraph as a single string. What you can do then is you can just call dot string concatenate on that collection and that will return a single string. So for example, with this little collection, if I run it, then we see the results. The results is a single string. This is a test. It's not a big function, but it's convenient to have this around all the time. There is an overload of the string concatenate method that takes a projection lambda expression. So for instance, here we have a little XML tree that simulates, for instance, a collection of text elements that you might get after querying an OpenXML document. And if you need to get a single string from this collection of elements, you can then use the expression root.elements dot string concatenate and pass it this lambda expression that takes an element and casts that element to a string, which is the normal way of getting the string from an element that contains text. And this returns a single concatenated string for all of those X element objects. If we run it, it produces this output. The next interesting extension method is the group adjacent extension method. Let me show you how this is useful when processing OpenXML markup. Let's take a look at this scenario. In this scenario, you have this small XML tree that represents an OpenXML document. It's analogous to an OpenXML document, except that it is extremely simplified. We have these paragraph elements. Each paragraph element has a style attribute that tells what style it is. And what we want to do is we want to segregate this document so that we see, first of all, that we have a heading one. Then we want to see all of the paragraphs that are underneath that heading one. And then we want to see this heading one. And we want to see all of the paragraphs under this heading one. We can write a linked XML query where we take root.elements and we group by the style attribute, casting it to a string. And then we can iterate through every group in those grouped paragraphs. And we can write out the key for each group. And we can write out all of the members in each group. And when we run this example, it looks like this. It 
group together the two headings, overview and introduction, and it grouped together all of the paragraphs regardless of which heading they were under. That wasn't really what we wanted. So instead of using the group by extension method here, we can use the group adjacent method. And when we run this, what this does is instead of creating two groups, one with the key of heading one and the other with the key of normal, this will create four groups because it will only group together paragraphs if they have the same key as adjacent paragraphs. So when we run it, we see, first of all, a new group for the heading one. Then we see all of the paragraphs underneath that heading one. And then we see another new group for the next heading one. And then we can see all of the paragraphs under that heading one. When you are processing an OpenXML document, this is a much more convenient way to look at the various headings and paragraphs. The next extension method is a little bit esoteric. However, it also is an important extension method when you're doing certain varieties of functional programming. The extension method is the roll-up extension method. The roll-up extension method is very similar to the select extension method in that you pass a collection to it and for every item in the collection your lambda expression returns a projection of that item. But there is one difference in that you first of all pass a seed into the roll-up extension method and then after having passed that seed the projection receives the seed or the previous item in the projection. So, for instance, you could use the rollup extension method to write code to produce a running total. Here we have a little example that, first of all, declares an array of integer, and we can use rollup here to project a running total. If we run this code, we see here the results of that, which is a running total of all of those integers. But more importantly than that, you can use the rollup extension method to effectively process elements in context. And what this means is that you effectively can make a state machine, except that this state machine is implemented using functional programming and there is no state maintained. Instead, what happens is that with each projection of the rollup, you pass the state for the next item in the rollup. So for instance, here we have a string, which is also a collection of characters, and we need to parse this into a collection of tokens. And the collection of tokens is such that a white space indicates that there is a new token, but if the white space happens to be in a quoted string, then the white space does not create a new token. So here we create a little teeny state machine that this state machine for each character passes the state of the state machine into the next character. And when we run it, we can see that we get a collection that says we're in a token or in white space or in a token or on the starting quote or in a quoted string and so on. And of course, if we combine that collection with the original collection of characters and project a new collection of anonymous types with the state and character in the anonymous type, then we see something like this where we see all of the characters and we see the state of those particular characters. So from this projection, we can see that here is a token, here's the white space, here's another token, more white space, here is the quoted string, and finally the last period is a character in a token. It's a little bit more esoteric, but it is needed on occasion. It's used in a couple of places in Power Tools for OpenXML, so I included it in this particular module. The next class to mention is the X entity class. 
there is an issue with linked to XML, which is if you need to serialize out an XML entity, it's very difficult to do so. Here I have a small linked to XML program where I want to serialize out a ampersand less than semicolon as content of this root element. But the problem is if I run it, linked to XML automatically changes that ampersand into an entity. And so you get this output, which is the root element and amp semicolon LT semicolon. And that's not what we wanted. We wanted ampersand LT semicolon. Well, what we can do is we can replace this code as follows. Where we instantiate a new X entity object and put it in the linked XML tree and the string passed to the X entity constructor is LT. And when we run it, we get exactly what we wanted to get, which is the ampersand LT semicolon. There are some caveats for this particular approach. You can find more information about serializing entities using linked to XML in this blog post. And last but not least is the zip extension method. The enumerable.zip extension method was introduced with the .NET Framework 4, but we use linked to XML and the OpenXML SDK commonly with the .NET Framework version 3.5. In particular, that is the version of the .NET Framework that you have to use to write SharePoint 2010 programs. Therefore, I included a very simple implementation of the zip extension method so that code in Power Tools for OpenXML that uses the zip extension method and need to work with the .NET Framework 3.5 can be compiled and run. Well, that's the end of this list of non-OpenXML specific extension methods and classes that are useful in Power Tools for OpenXML. In another screencast, I discuss the extension methods and classes and utilities that are interesting in PT OpenXML util.cs, which is a set of utilities that are OpenXML specific.